Hi, welcome everyone to breakout session three entitled What About My Goods and Deliveries? I'm James McGeeky, Technical and Programme Director here at the Zemo Partnership. And it's my pleasure to chair today's session in conjunction with my colleague, Brian Robson, Robinson, sorry, Brian, who leads our commercial vehicle working group. Um, before we begin, uh, a few quick housekeeping rules. If you've not already done so, if you can please mute, mute your microphone to minimize background noise, that would be great. Um, we do encourage you to turn your cameras on though, to give as human a feel as possible to what is ultimately a virtual event. Um, and similarly, please do make full use of the chat function to raise questions. Uh, ideally, if you can state who the question is addressed to, along with your own name and organization, that would be great. Um, these will be monitored by the Zemo team throughout the session and will feed into the Q&A that follows the speaker presentations. Um, I do believe as well that you can even vote for questions that have already been raised if you've got a particular favorite. Um, finally, I should make you aware that today's session is being recorded. Um, those recordings will be then made available on the Zemo website. So with that out of the way, uh, onto the session proper. Um, the focus for the next hour will be on solutions, specifically what can be done today to decarbonize transport in the areas of goods and deliveries. Um, so with that in mind, I'm happy to say that we have a great panel of speakers to help us in this regard covering topics across the whole spectrum from policy to biofuels to supermarkets, from HGVs to e-cargo. And to set the scene, each speaker will deliver a short presentation before we progress to a Q&A discussion. So let's make a start with our first speaker today, who is Grace Limburg, Freight Decarbonisation Policy Advisor with the DFT. Grace joined the Department for Transport in 2019, originally working in the Centre for Connected and Autonomous Vehicles before moving across the Environment Strategy Team, where she works on freight decarbonisation policy. Her team were responsible for coordinating the freight policies in the recently published Decarbonising Transport at Better Greener Britain, and are now leading the consultation on phase-out dates for the sale of new non-zero emission HGVs, which is open until the beginning of September. All of which, I hope you agree, makes Grace the ideal person to kick off our session today, providing an overview of the headline freight policies emerging from last week's release of the Transport Decarbonisation Plan. So over to you, Grace. Thanks, James. I'm going to have to hand to Malcolm, please, to upload the slides because uh, I'm having some technical difficulties. No problem. Thank, thank you, Grace. That just proves that it's real and live, Grace. I think, I think that's what I'm <laughs> It is indeed. Um, are they full screen? Perfect, great. Um, yeah, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm Grace Slimberg, and as James said, I work in the Environment Strategy Team on freight decarbonisation in the Department for Transport. Um, so some of you may have heard the head of our team, Dr. Bob Moran, um, speaking in a Q&A earlier. So I, yeah, I just really want to thank the Zemo Partnership for inviting me to speak today. It's a great opportunity for us to begin our stakeholder engagement of which there will be lots over the next few months. Um, and I've got the slightly daunting task of representing the department um, as I talk you through three of the key publications that we launched last week, uh, which you can see on the screen. So that's the Transport Decarbonisation Plan, which is called Decarbonising Transport, a Better Greener Britain and from the Transport Decarbonisation Plan, we've got two consultations, one on when to phase out the sale of new non-zero emission HGVs, and one on a new UK road vehicle CO2 emission framework. Um, can I have the next slide, please, Malcolm? Thank you. So I'll start with the Transport Decarbonisation Plan which I'm sure has been long awaited by many of you on the call. Um, and the TDP sets out a comprehensive plan spanning all modes of transport to put the entire transport sector on a path to net zero by 2050. And the plan includes commitments um, across the transport sector, so increasing cycling and walking, electrifying the rail network, consulting on zero emission vehicle mandates for new road vehicles and consulting on a target for net zero domestic aviation by 2040. And there's a whole chapter on decarbonizing the freight sector, which is what I'm really here to talk to you about today. Um, but before I move on to freight, I just uh, wanted to say how proud we are of the TDP. It's taken two years of work to get here. Um, and while we don't claim that it contains 
all the answers for the next 30 or so years. Um, it is the biggest piece of work that we've ever done to tackle emissions from transport and it sets out an ambitious, incredible path to net zero. Um, and we feel that the largely positive response we've had from environmental groups and from industry um, has shown us that we are on the right lines. Um, and if you haven't already read it, then I encourage you to do so. I think it's about 200 pages, so it shouldn't take you too long. Um, next slide, please, Malcolm. So as I mentioned, the TDP has a whole chapter on freight, uh, which is linked to one of the transport decarbonisation plan strategic priorities, decarbonising how we get our goods. So I'd imagine that the key policy that was of interest to many of you on the call today uh, were our proposed dates to phase out the set of new non-zero emission heavy goods vehicles. Um, we believe the dates that we've put forward are ambitious but achievable um, and reflect what's needed for the UK's HGV fleet to deliver its contribution to net zero by 2050. Supporting our phase out dates are the upcoming zero emission road freight trials, which will demonstrate zero emission HGVs in operation on UK roads this year. So the 20 million uh, zero emission road freight trials will develop and test in the infrastructure for zero emission HGVs, um, focusing on the three principal technology options. So electric HGV, battery electric, hydrogen fuel cell and electric road systems. And we're really confident that these trials, which are investing in research, innovation, and the construction of zero emission HGVs by UK businesses, UK based businesses and SMEs, will speed up the decarbonisation of our road freight sector and address some of the key barriers around infrastructure, which uh, we know is a common complaint. Uh, the TDP contains other freight related policies. So things to support the uptake of new zero emission models already on the market. So that's through the plug-in truck grant, uh, which provides up to £25,000 of funding to reduce uh, the purchase price of zero emission commercial HGVs. Um, it also commits to introducing a rail freight growth target to support the modal shift of freight from road to rail. Uh, this would not only reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but would also have noise and congestion and air quality benefits as well. And uh, finally, we take forward some of the policies from last year's cycling and walking plan in our last mile section. So, for example, we commit to piloting, allowing local authorities to franchise delivery and waste management services uh, to reduce the number of vehicles and therefore emissions on, on our roads in the present day. Next slide, please, Malcolm. So I don't want to spend too long on the TDP uh, because otherwise I wouldn't get to talk about the consultations that we launched as well. So the first one is on uh, when to phase out the sale of new non-zero emission HDVs. Uh, and we're proposing to introduce two phase out dates depending on vehicle weight. So 2035 or earlier, if a faster transition seems feasible, for ending the sale of new non-zero emission HGVs between 3.5 and 26 tonnes, and then a 2040 date for HGVs greater than 26 tonnes. So as you can imagine, we deliberated on the wording quite a bit before settling on the phrase non-zero emission HGVs which um, we know is a bit of a mouthful, uh, but we feel makes clear our ambition to create a fully zero emission road freight fleet, uh, where zero emission technologies come to the fore with both decarbonisation and air quality benefits. So those were the two things we had to weigh up and factor into this decision. Uh, and tied in with this consultation is also a question on whether to increase the maximum permissible weight for alternatively fueled and zero emission HGVs up to a maximum gross vehicle weight of 44 tonnes. So this could address the increased weight of zero emission technologies, which we know can prove a barrier to uptake. Um, the consultation is open and closes on the 3rd of September, and we strongly encourage you to submit a response if you haven't already. Uh, next slide, please. 
So the last thing I wanted to introduce you to uh, was the green paper on a new road vehicle CO2 emissions regulatory framework uh, called the green paper for short. Um, and this seeks to take advantage of the fact that we're now outside the EU and are free to develop our own regulatory framework tailored specifically to UK needs. So the framework will enforce our 2030 and 2035 phase out commitments for petrol and diesel cars and vans, as well as future phase out dates for other non-zero emission road vehicles, such as HGVs once, was at, once our consultation is closed. Um, and the green paper puts forward two options for consultation. So the first is tightening the existing efficiency-based regulations, which require the new vehicle fleet to become more efficient and deploying a zero emission vehicle or a ZEV mandate alongside CO2 regulation. And the second option was recommended by the Climate Change Committee and is the government's preferred option because it would ensure that the deployment of new zero emission vehicles, including HGVs, can be guaranteed. Um, and we believe that the two consultations together, so the phase out date consultation and the green paper, will create regulatory certainty for industry, uh, drive UK investment in low carbon technologies, and help to ensure the supply and uptake of zero emission vehicles to meet our um, commitments. And the Green Paper consultation is also open and closes on the 22nd of September. And as with the HGV consultation, we strongly encourage you to submit a response. Um, there was a final slide uh, with the email addresses for both those consultations. So I can pop those in the chat um, if anyone has any further questions. Um, and that was quite a whistle stop tour. So I hope that was useful for everyone. I'm a bit out of breath now. Um, so I'll hand over to uh, everyone else on the panel and then I'm around to answer questions later. Thank you, Grace, that was brilliant. And, and thank you for the whistle stop. It is um, a, an impossible task in somewhat for all of the speakers today. We are asking you to cram a lot into a very short space of time. Um, uh, as, a, as a bit of a sidebar, um, I've got some of the results from the pre-conference survey here in front of me. Um, in which we ask people to comment on when technologies will be available to cost effectively allow the delivery of goods to be zero carbon emission. Um, uh, just out of interest, 2040 proved to be the most popular response, followed by uh, 2030, which based on the sort of dates that you've just quoted, Grace, um, kind of fits in quite nicely. Um, but almost showing the, uh, highlighting the challenge of reaching a consensus, however. Um, on the flip side, 30% thought 2050 was, uh, and was more appropriate or beyond. Um, so I think that just illustrates the, uh, the difficulty of the challenge, if nothing else. But thank you very much for, for going through that. Um, so next up, um, we have uh, Tanya Nietzsche, who's the UK Sustainability Officer at Scania GB. Um, Tanya is responsible for sustainability across Scania's UK business. Her role covers local and national business strategy, the energy and carbon reduction roadmap, and the company's sustainable transport solutions portfolio. She joined Scania as part of the bus and coach team, initially focusing on the delivery of the low carbon buses, mainly associated with biomethane products. Prior to joining Scania, Tanya was director and founder of a UK transport consultancy, TC UK, delivering bespoke solutions to transport operators. And most of her early experience was gained while working for the Go Ahead group under operating company Go South Coast. So welcome, Tanya. Thanks, James. Um, I haven't got any slides, so I don't know if we can just leave it as a gallery or whether you want to put anything up. Um, no, no, go for it. That's I'm fine. just going to go for a quick five minute introduction. Yeah, so just hi, everyone. I'm delighted to be here and, and have this opportunity to speak in this session today. And it was just really kind of a reflection on, wow, what a crazy couple of weeks. And I'm, I'm sure there's definitely more to come, like Grace said, with just the various announcements and things that are happening. Um, so we've just seen this flurry of activity um, with the release of, of the TDP and, and all of the support and consultations that come with that. And obviously Scania now will need to work hard to review all the detail in those and, and we'll be actively engaged in, in that process along with our customers and our partners. And of course, with support from, um, from our global business. Um, we really welcome the plan. Um, I've been banging on about it for a long time now. So it's really, really important that it's been released and we're glad to see it come out before, before summer. 
um, but we don't under underestimate the challenge that, that this plan has set and as well as the kind of the ambition that's being outlined for us all here it's um it's pretty big pretty big so just as a quick introduction, um, just in terms of Scania, because I don't sure, I'm not sure if everyone on the, on the call is aware of, of us as a company. So Scania, we're a major supplier of trucks, buses, coaches, and engines, um, specifically in the heavy end of the market. Um, and in addition to that, we do do um, a, a wide range of services to support our products and our customers. And we do this through um, 86 um, service centers across the whole of the UK. So it's quite a big, um, quite a big coverage in terms of the UK market. Um, in 2020, our share of the UK heavy truck market was around about 18%, and our combined bus and coach market share was, uh, was around about 10%. So um, sustainability, that's kind of my, my, my thing. Um, it's central to, to Scania's operations um, and driving the shift um, to more sustainable transport solutions. It's a key element of, of the organization's kind of global strategy and our philosophy today. Um, something that I'm really, really proud of is that we, um, we signed up to science-based targets um, during the pandemic, actually, it was approved, and we became the first manufacturer in our sector to have um, an approved science-based target. So obviously, this means that we're committed to achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement and limiting that global warming to 1.5 degrees. And what that means in principle um, for us in the UK, um, in line with, with what we're trying to all achieve today, is that we will cut CO2 emissions from our own operations in the UK by 50%, and that's um, in 2025, and that's on a baseline to 2015. And then the important one that affects probably the conversations today is that we will reduce emissions from our customers' vehicles, both new and those already in use, by 20% during that same period. So as Dita said earlier this morning, I think cutting our carbon consumption is now like the utterly important part of what we're all here to discuss. So, I mean, legislation on heavy duty vehicle CO2 kind of focuses on that, that tailpipe emissions. But for, for us now to successfully reach the targets that we're all talking about, we do need a wider perspective. So all the energy carriers, um, the kind of low zero carbon for, fuels, electricity or hydrogen, they've all got to be de decarbonized for us to, to meet those goals. So what we really need and what we're kind of calling for is that the policymakers need to address that kind of whole value chain and for the vehicles to apply that kind of well to wheel perspective. So just in terms of what Scania offer, um, so Scania offer the widest range of engines available, so particularly capable of running on something like a renewable synthetic diesel, meaning that already today we can reduce emissions by up to 90%. Now our gas range is well established. It's kind of my little um, my little love. Um, it's part of our offer, um, with several customers choosing this as a renewable fuel option today. But there is no silver bullet, so we know that there will not be just one mode or one technology or one fuel that will rule everything. But there will need to be parallel choices over time. The Scania have always said that once it makes sense for our customers to invest in electrified trucks, we will be ready. And we've kind of all been waiting for this kind of moment for that to happen. And, and we're now here. So um, in September last year, Scania launched a fully electric truck and a high performance plug in hybrid truck. Now, these vehicles are initially focused on urban applications, so including distribution to retailers. And in certain segments of markets, electrification is definitely a good investment. You know, that's kind of part of the picture. Um, and we will continue to develop our range of electrified vehicles for all applications. So going beyond that, including long haul and construction vehicles. And I think we've already publicly committed um, that we will launch at least one new electric product every year now going forward. James, I don't know how much time I've got left. If you want to kick me off, uh, just, just no, tell you've, me. You've, got, you've still got a full 60 seconds, if you like. Yes! Tanya. OK, <laughs> so in a few years time, we will introduce a long distance electric truck. So that will be able to power a total weight of 40 tonnes for up to four and a half hours. And it will be a fast charged um, model based on driver's hours of compulsory 45 minute rest period. So our objective is to enable decarbonised transport solutions with better transport economy for our customers with predictable and repeatable transport needs. That's kind of where we are today. So by 2025, Scania expects that electric, electrified vehicles will account for around 10% of our total vehicle sales volumes in Europe. And by 2030, 50% of our total vehicle sales volumes are expected to be electrified. So it, it's a big part of what we do. I will quickly skip on, because I know that I haven't got a lot of time, but 
I mean, great vehicles, yeah, they're absolutely crucial to what we need to do and the, the, the need is there for urgent investment. But for us, it's now all about charging infrastructure, you know, a, and a proper price on carbon to reach cost parity between something that's sustainable and, and something that's conventional. Um, so I do think we do need to bring everybody along on this journey. Um, so learning and sharing our experiences will be key. And I would just say that finally, I just want to highlight some initiatives like the Renewable Fuel Assurance Scheme that's run by Gloria and the team at Zemo. Um, it's totally important and needed. And I mean, it's the latest kind of um, education piece for me around what we're trying to achieve. And then just also the freight portal, which has just had a bit of a revamp. Because I think these types of vital tools are what we need to ensure that both like us as a, as a kind of stakeholder group and our customers can all build that knowledge and have that confidence so we can, we can all move forward together. That's excellent stuff. Thank you, Tanya. Um, and I've also got a couple of pro promos in there for renewable fuel and assurance scheme and the freight port, but excellent work. Um, so now we move on to our next speaker, who's Magnus Hammock. He's Chief Operating Officer at Green Biofuels Limited. Um, Magnus leads the Green Biofuels team in developing solutions to help industry reduce emissions and improve local air quality. Um, as a company, Green Biofuels are the largest importer of HVO into the UK and produce their own improved HVO product called Green B+. Uh, they supply customers across numerous sectors, including construction, marine, mobile power, and of most interest for this session, the owners and operators of light goods vehicles and heavy goods vehicles. Uh, and as Tanya's already uh, very nicely teed up for me, I'm also very pleased to say that the Green Biofuels are an approved company under the Zemo Renewable Fuels Assurance Scheme. Uh, so Magnus, over to you. Uh, thank you, James, and uh, I'm delighted to uh, be on this panel today uh, for the Zeno Partnership talking about um, Green D+, Plus, which is one of Green Biofuels um, drop-in solutions for, to help our customers reach their net, net zero targets. Just checking, James, that you can, I'm sharing my screen properly. Sorry. No worries, it's okay. Yep, we can see something. It's not quite full square. There we go, that's brilliant. Great, thanks Magnus. Is that good? It is. Sorry about that. Um, so I'd like to thank, uh, thank our hosts, uh, Zeno Partnership, and uh, today we're going to walk through um, drop-in um, sustainable renewable fuel alternatives to fossil diesel. Um, and we consider ourselves as a transition uh, business. We're transitioning, um, we're a transition pathway to new drivetrain technologies, uh, uh, but we offer a here and now solution. So, as a business, we only supply sustainable renewable fuels and we um, operate and supply a diesel replacement to a number of different um, uh, industries. And obviously today we're gonna concentrate on road transport, um, but obviously our fuel will go into any, any diesel engine without modification. Um, and on this journey, uh, We've heard uh, Tanya's very eloquently mentioned lots of different ways to decarbonize and lots of different solutions. And usefully, uh, this, is the, th this seems to be a toolbox that would describe uh, the, the energy pathways that are becoming available and will be available in the future. So we've, we, know, we're, we know and love the B7 blend that we see at the pumps, which uh, is the mandated reduction using a bio blend in our, our regular diesel. We then have a 100% drop-in replacement, which is a Green DHVO product, which gives you uh, greenhouse gases, gas reduction of up to 90%. Um, and then other areas uh, of, of uh, well, other, other energy sources. So we have natural gas, LNG, uh, biogas, CNG, electricity. Um, and we've heard that transition pathway to the smaller, smaller drive trains is, is is in train and, and very much uh, enacted at the moment. And then uh, hydrogen. And what I would say is that uh, 
CNG, LNG, the networks are starting to be built, and there is a there is a great pathway for those uh, for, for those for those fuel and vehicles. Uh, electricity networks and infrastructure we've heard over the last few days are being developed, and, and many millions of pounds have been invested into the into that, um, that uh, those strategies and those charging points. Hydrogen, perhaps um, most topical uh, within the heavy sector, and obviously we're waiting for developments both in technology to create green hydrogen, but also um, networks to actually distribute amongst uh, through the um, distribute to the end users. So what's the impact of a drop-in replacement a here and now solution? So um, Bayes this year published a default value for HVO, which is uh, hydro-treated vegetable oil. Um, that uh, default value shows that for every litre of diesel we displace, we save 2.83 kilograms of CO2e per litre. So that is a twelfth of the carbon emissions of a regular fossil vehicle. So for one one vehicle running on fossil diesel, we can run the equivalent of 12 vehicles running on a sustainable renewable fuel. And that is a significant difference and a significant game changer here and now. But we shouldn't stop there because while um, global emissions are obviously the target of net zero and the, and the department, um, TDM, uh, TDP, sorry, um, what we need to also think about is actually tailpipe emissions. How do we not only reduce uh, greenhouse gases, but we improve local air quality as well, um, which has started to become a focus. And we believe that advanced fuels allow us to do that. So HVO is a, is a sustainable renewable fuel. It's made from virgin crops, uh, sort of non-virgin crops, waste derived um, feedstocks. And it's a refined product. It's very pure. Um, uh, hydrocarbon, which is a which is a paraffinic fuel. Well, apologies, Magnus. Um, one minute to go. Okay. Um, the benefits of the fuel is that it, it significantly reduces emissions. Uh, the tailpipe, eighty-five percent less particulate matter and less NOx. Has no um, no no um, degradation through storage, and uh, it's a full drop and replacement. Uh, Tanya very helpfully mentioned uh, the transparency and uh, sustainability through the Renewable Fuel Assurance Scheme, which has been led by Gloria's team. But actually, there is a whole, this journey to net zero through using transition um, fuels like Green D is something which is now very well audited and, and has a very, is a very low risk strategy for our, our partners and customers. And what, what, just to finish, a case study is always a really good thing. So Hovis have been running on our fuel for the last three years. And then in, in such doing, they have uh, traveled 30 million miles currently uh, on Green D+. And as a result of the, that um, transition pathway, have saved over 24,000 metric tons of carbon. So it shouldn't be, when are we gonna transition or why, uh, why should we transition? It is here and now, it's happening today. Thank you very much, Magnus, that's great. And apologies for, uh, for hurrying along there. Um, what we needed was a two hour session, I think, to do this one justice. Um, now, bringing an operator perspective to the discussion, we've got Cliff Smith, who's Fleet Engineering Manager for Tesco's. Um, Cliff has worked for Tesco's for over 20 years in a number of different roles. And in his current position, he has responsibility for the dot-com fan fleet, so five and a half thousand vans, and also the light goods vehicle fleet, uh, 2,000 vehicles and four and a half thousand trailers. Um, his remit is to ensure that Tesco van and truck fleet leads the way in terms of advances in technology and innovation, whilst also being legally compliant, safe, and as fuel efficient as possible. So, uh, so no small task there. Um, Cliff, over to you. Thanks very much for that wonderful intro there, James. So uh, just while I um, uh, 
I fire up my uh, screen to share. Um, so what, what I'm going to do this afternoon is very quickly, obviously, um, I'm going to share our, our journey so far as, a, as, a, as an early adopter of, uh, of EVs, uh, primarily in the three and a half tonne to four and a quarter tonne gross vehicle weight category uh, that have been now placed into our dot com operation. Uh, so, you know, in terms of the transition to a zero carbon fleet, uh, what I will say is, um, Although this pr primarily vans uh, that are leading and edging towards HEV, a lot of the knowledge that we've gained as a business is, is definitely transferable. So I'll try and go to the next slide if I can. Okay, so um, yeah, so our journey so far, so uh, a few years ago, so 2019, we trialed two EVs in .com. Those trial results uh, really uh, aligned with the modeling that we'd put together uh, prior to that. So last year we, we purchased an additional 30 EVs and happy to say they're, they're running around Greater London as we speak today, delivering to our customers. So on the back of that, we, we really announced uh, publicly uh, some really ambitious plans to have a fully electric dot-com fleet by the end of 2028. So in order to do that, we're, we're ramping up EV purchases year on year so that from 2024, all of our van purchases will all be EV. Initially, um, I, I think this is a sort of one of the learnings is um, we've chosen stores areas where the catchment area for our customers aligns with the range of the current EVs, uh, albeit that there are a very small number of EVs available in that range in chassis cab. But we know that in the future, as battery technology uh, pushes forward and more manufacturers come online, uh, we will be able to face into longer journey uh, store EV transition. So what does our time frame look like? So for .com, uh, mentioned about what we'd already done, but literally you can see 150 we're going to deploy this year, and then that quickly ramps up to 250 the following year, 500 the year after, and then really after that, it's a thousand plus every every van that we would purchase uh, would be electric. So really just starting to, to, to sort of give you a view on, on the learnings and what have we discovered so far. I think it's, uh, it's definitely the right thing to start with a small number um, uh, to, to gain knowledge. Uh, and really, uh, I guess the, the, the big learning for me was for, for two vehicles, very easy to, to take that project upon yourself. Uh, and to be able to put in a couple of charge points is quite simple. But when you ramp that up, you really do need the engagement and collaboration with other key uh, parts of your business. So uh, in, in Tesco, uh, uh, as an example, we set up a cross-functional uh, natural work team that included lots of different areas, but definitely included procurement, engineering ourselves, uh, our energy team, uh, our property team, which uh, is going to have a massive uh, impact to their day job, the operational team and responsible sourcing. Uh, not, not, uh, not forgetting as well some specialist third parties that we were able to uh, locate on the back of some of the customer charge points that we put in some of our stores some years ago. So, um, yeah, re real learning on, on who needs to be involved to support you and your business as you transition into uh, electric vehicles. I mentioned it earlier, limited suitable vehicle availability, but we know that uh, and certainly through uh, the conference today, we've heard from more EV manufacturers are going to come online over the next few years. Big learning for us was driver training. Um, and, and certainly if you use your own in-house driver trainers, you will need to ensure that that training for EVs is suitable uh, because that uh, can really play havoc with the range of, uh, of EVs. Maintenance, uh, you shouldn't forget that as well. So if you do carry out your own maintenance, there'll be some upskilling of, of uh, uh, how to maintain safely electric vehicles. Um, so you, you, you should always consider that. And um, I think um, out of all the uh, different areas, if you look at the three key areas, the vehicle, the charger, uh, maintenance, probably the charger infrastructure is the more technical. Uh, and certainly what we've seen as we look to deploy EVs into different stores, it's not one charger um, uh, option will work everywhere. So you need to have lots of different options and lots of specialists to support you. Um, lastly, uh, certainly not least, um, as we transition from, from diesel to electric, obviously it's really easy for, a, for an operational manager to understand 
there's my diesel fleet. They're all full of fuel. Away we go. Not so easy with an electric vehicle. So management information, the right software that's going to work behind the scenes, looking at your your charging systems uh, and, and and which vehicles are ready to go, will also be key as you as you make that transition uh, over over to electric vehicles. That's it. That's my whistle stop tour of what we've done so far. Hope it's been. Um, uh, uh, uh sort of insightful um and yeah thanks very much over to you uh james thank you very much cliff that was excellent um great whistle stop tour through and i could see it sparked quite a few questions in chat as well which is great um uh, so last but by no means least it's my pleasure now to introduce leo bethel from who's head of partnerships at eav solutions uh he's here to tell us a little bit about the innovative e-cargo vehicle solutions manufactured by eav um I should explain that Leo, bless him, has been dropped into this in the last hour or so, as Adam, our, our original speaker, unfortunately, has fallen ill. So we wish Adam a speedy recovery and, uh, and very much appreciate Leo stepping in at short notice. Over to you, Leo. Thanks for the introduction, James. Can you see my screen? We can indeed, yes. Excellent. Yeah, so hi, everyone. I'm Leo, head of partnerships at EVE. Um, we stand for electric assisted vehicles, and we've been around for about two and a half years now. Um, as a reaction to congestion, pollution, and um, sort of logistics inefficiency in inner cities in particular. Um, so what you can see on screen there is our model lineup currently. Um, we're focusing on the last mile, but also today, um, quite excitingly, we're launching the um, second to right vehicle too, which is our mid-mile vehicle um, called the Eve Links. So this is our ecosystem um, that will be sort of running in the next couple of years. Um, and our aim is to be the complete provider of sustainable urban transport by 2025. Um, so yeah, really, really focusing on the urban mobility. Here's our current vehicle, the EVE2 Cubed. Um, it's mainly targeted so far at the courier um, and supermarket industries, but effectively anywhere you're using a small van, you could replace with this um, EVE cargo bike, um, which yeah, the main benefits are it can suit the legislation of an e-bike, so you can go up um, cycle lanes and through pedestrian zones. So it can go right up to the customer's front door um, and go the fastest route. So we're, we're seeing efficiencies versus a van in the inner cities um, for those sort of small to mid volume um, deliveries. Um, so some of our main customers at the moment are the likes of um, Amazon, Ocado, Asda, um, FedEx. And the vehicle was designed with DPD um, a couple of years ago. So we've really taken all of the um, learnings we've had from these industries and then made a vehicle that's designed down from a van rather than up from a bike um, to sort of have that automotive quality um, that I think the market is potentially lacking at the moment. So yeah, as, as I said, the, the, the vehicle is zero emissions um, and can go the most efficient way to the customer's front door. Um, we use slide in, slide out lithium ion batteries, um, that of an e-bike and our, our main ethos is about being lightweight and light tech. So anything the vehicle um, doesn't need, it won't have an in, in aim to minimize the weight possible. Um, so you're maximizing the energy efficiency of the vehicle um, and you don't need the charging infrastructure either of, a, of an e-van e um, because the batteries just plug in like a normal laptop charger um, into a three pin plug. The, one of the biggest benefits of being a, a new and up and coming OEM is that we don't need the legacy operations of a large sort of automotive OEM. So we can be really reactive to the market. Um, so this is one of the models we produce for the e-scooter industry. Um, and we have, we have a couple of customers across Europe for this particular model. Um, it's just an example of, of the sort of speed we can get a product to market. And even though I suppose the theme of this webinar is about freight, um, we're also looking into um, carrying passengers as well. So a lot, a lot of our operations are hinging around our roll-on, roll-off box. So this is designed to have maximum use of the vehicle. So you could potentially be a taxi driver at night and a delivery driver by day by taking one of our roll-on, roll-off pods. Um, and you can even take uh, a wheelchair access. Um, so it's really designed for sort of that um, the gig economy worker who's who's working all day um, to maximise their personal income. And then here's the uh, here's the vehicle that we're sort of launching today, the Eve Links. It's it's a um, vehicle designed for micro consolidation in cities. So it will take away the stem leg um, of the journey and then be able to meet up with a fleet of cargo bikes um, 
in the inner city. So, so the idea and our vision is the cargo bike will potentially occupy a, a mile squared in the inner city and the Eve links will have, will be able to um, have this sort of mobile hub and spoke model where it can meet up with this fleet of cargo bikes and take five different pods to the cargo bike, um, which means that your road miles are halved um, and your efficiencies increase because you only have one vehicle subject to congestion, which is our Eve links on board. Um, and again, this is a very lightweight vehicle, so it's going to be an L7E category vehicle. Um, again, going with our ethos of lightweight. Um, the obvious benefits of lightweight over being heavy are you don't have as many tyre particulates um, generated um, and the obvious benefits of being electric. Uh, so about other, 30 seconds left to go, sorry, Leah. Thanks, James. Um, so, yeah, the, the other benefit of this, of this vehicle is you don't need the same real, um, real estate in the inner city because this vehicle could act as your micro consolidation centre. Um, so in London, for example, right now, it's expensive and difficult to get that real estate. Um, so instead, you can have your consolidation center on the outside of the city and then transport cargo inside using this dynamic hub and spoke model, um, as I've uh, mentioned in this presentation. Um, so, yeah, this is how we see the future of cities. Um, we think the future is lightweight and also, um, yeah, emission free. So, uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Cool. Thank you very much, Leah. It's great stuff. Um, so, we've now reached the, the Q&A part of the proceedings. Uh, I understand from the text that we had a bit of a technical issue, so you guys might would have, uh, have missed the housekeeping aspects. Um, but I can see uh, people have put questions in chat, which is, is what we were aiming for. Um, do encourage people to turn their cameras on if they wish to do so, just to try and make it a little more human being if we can as a virtual event. Um, and then, Brian, I know you've had your eye on the questions and the chat window. Uh, what have we got in there that we'd like to uh, put to the panel? Yes, thank you. And uh, yes, I was one of the um, uh, victims of the glitch. So uh, I thought you might be. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. 25 minutes after the start. But uh, anyway, uh, hopefully we've got the gist. Yes, so we've had. So do you want me to read the questions out or do you want to go to whoever posed the question to uh, read, the, read it out? Uh, no, if, we, if you could read them out on their behalf, that'd be excellent. Okay, so, um, uh, so Tanya, there were a couple of questions for you. One, one I think has already been answered in the chat, but Natasha Patel uh, was asking about total cost of ownership, TCO, and when, when do you think they will make sense for operators and how is that? Uh, split by different te te technologies. Uh, Natasha particularly mentioned biomethane. I guess that's kind of cost effective in the right duty cycles now, but uh, appreciate your views. EVs, of course, uh, and hydrogen. I know Scanny have some pretty strong views on hydrogen, but um, so total cost of ownerships and, um, and different technologies. Yeah, I think it's quite a... a... <laughs> a puzzle for different operators, different different um, applications. I think it's it depends on what fuel, what what customer and what they're trying to achieve. I mean, I know that in the bus market, we've modeled biomethane, for example, in double deckers, and it, it works in that application because of, of what that vehicle is trying to achieve, its daily mileage and, and the job that it's trying to do. So I would just say that TCO is, is difficult, I'd say, when it comes to EV, and we're not quite there yet, but I would say, um, in some of the other markets where the incentives are different to the UK, that that TCO is starting to, to be easier to model. Um, and with hydrogen, obviously, we've publicly said that we are um, kind of, um, we're not going down the hydrogen route at the moment. It's more BEV, um, BEV focused for the next 10 years. And that is on the basis of quite an informed study on TCO for the next 10 years. So I would say that hydrogen, we're definitely not there at the moment, but for EV and for, for, for renewable fuels, there's definitely models available that, that do exist for different customers in different markets. Stuff, thanks, Tanya. Uh, I wonder, can I, can I throw one in, Brian? Am I allowed to do yeah, that? I've used my position as chair. Um, th th this is where the panel are not going to like me, I think. So it's a good job with virtual pat. Um, so the classic question, uh, I think, um, in, in the panel's opinion, so, so kind of uh, answer at your will, um, what do you think is the single biggest factor currently slowing down the transition to zero emission vehicles? Obviously, you, you know, you, you will re represent different areas of the industry and, and different vehicles as well. Um, but in, in your opinion and your experience, you know, what, what's, what's slowing that down in goods and delivery? What, what's in the way? Um, I guess, uh, let's start with Cliff. 
Thanks, James. Um, I think uh, certainly for us, uh, uh, and I guess it, it's different for every uh, fleet operator, but the um, the current offer uh, of, of vehicle types uh, is an issue. Uh, and we know that, you know, in the next sort of 12, 18, 24 months, um, lots more manufacturers will come online. Um, that's probably our biggest hurdle. Uh, there are there are smaller ones. So uh, an interesting one I'm looking at at the moment is um, so there's a derogation on 18 ton vehicles converting to, to 19 ton for EV. It doesn't look like TFL have caught up with that yet. So they're still sort of um, holding back, allowing 19 ton electric vehicles uh, uh, going through the the uh, LLCS. Uh, but we're fingers crossed, hopeful that that barrier will will lift. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the, it's it's the options around uh, vehicle types and availability that's that's holding us back currently. Cool. And, and Cliff, would you um, would you say is that primarily in the the lighter end um, in terms of for, for your own particular applications, or obviously the the heavier end is perhaps it's fair to say less choice at the moment. There is. So I think in the heavier end, we're starting to see opportunities in the rigid vehicle uh, uh, sort of area of the business uh, and, and green shoots of, uh, of tractors. However, certainly for us, an electric tractor is, a, is I don't think we're, we're near where we need to be in terms of going to trial. But uh, electric rigid vehicles do interest us and we're, you know, trying to move at pace uh, on, on trialing them and, and starting to introduce them. And I guess in reality, we're probably two to three years behind our trajectory for dot com vans is, is probably where we are. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Um, Leo, your thoughts? Yeah, so I suppose um, as the OEM ourselves, I've got a, um, I suppose, contrary opinion to Cliff. So um, from what I've seen from the market, it's um, the operators themselves, but perhaps at times lacking the um, versatility to, to switch to electric. There's obviously a lot of hurdles you've got to jump through, um, rider training, range anxiety, uh, charging infrastructure, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I think, um, yeah, a, a lot of operators can switch. Um, they just, I think, need the... Um, innovation and obviously I'm, I'm pushing lightweight vehicles it's, it's a bit of a different um, vehicle class to, to your classic um, large trucks so I think from my perspective it's innovation in cities and having a go at it I think that there's a lot of operators who could but are potentially scared to dip their toe in the water to start with um, and, and especially in the cargo bike industry they're looking for someone to lead the way um, in a large scale um, I suppose Going, going with Cliff, um, Cliff's opinion, um, there in my industry potentially lacks the, the scale of production at the moment to be able to do this on a, on a really large scale. Very cool. And you mentioned the, the, uh, the link, which we're, we're actually very proud that you've launched at our conference, which is fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, the, that, that's an L7E vehicle, I think you suggested in terms of category. Is, yeah. is that proven challenging to uh, homologate or are there, are there any barriers in that area? So, so we're doing trials later this year. We have, we have approached it with TFL and the DOT as well. So they're, they're well aware of this vehicle. Um, there, there will be some hurdles to jump through, yes. Um, we're starting trials, yeah, end, end of this year, beginning of next year. So hopefully I'll have more of a um, concrete answer for you then. Cool. Okay, well, hopefully it's an easy path. Um, cool. Uh, Tanya? Same question. I guess you might have some of the answers actually to some of the requests. But... Yeah, I'm not good at short answers, so I'll try and keep this as short as possible. I think it was just reflecting on what Cliff said about the collaboration piece, because for me, one of my roles has been to kind of do this coordination role, have this kind of virtual organization in, in our own business. We bring in all the different teams, we bring in purchasing, we bring in finance, we bring all these people in and we take them with us on this kind of learning journey. And if you then take that and put that to the external sales model, I think the way that we buy and sell products now is going to have to change. And I think that might be a kind of barrier because I think the traditional sales guy goes to sell a diesel truck, you know, and he's got this relationship with, with, with maybe one person or, or he has a relationship with, with, with a particular fleet manager. I think the, the whole buying process now needs to kind of morph that internal process. I think maybe the skill sets in, in both the, the operator and in the manufacturer needs to grow 
and I think the partners now, because they now have to be involved as well, it becomes a big coordinated piece of work, which I think can be quite a handful. Um, and because everybody's learning as well, there needs to be a, a lot of baby steps, you know, everyone needs to keep up and a lot of the language is changing and, and everything is completely different. So I think it's just one of those behaviour change kind of learning pieces that that's a small thing to fix, but actually is more complicated than what you think. Sure, no, great, great answer actually. And it, it reflects perhaps on behavioural change that wasn't discussed in, in the morning's conference actually, that was more around getting people to use things differently. But. Uh, yeah, probably hadn't considered the kind of buy and purchase and, and sales aspect. Um, Magnus, obviously, you know, HVO, um, you've mentioned the Renewable Fuels Assurance Scheme and other, other accreditations. I mean, what's, what's, the, what's, what's the thing that's potentially standing in the way or slowing things down? I don't think anything's particularly standing in the way. Um, I think that um, there is a you know we're on a journey um and and we need to make we need the run room or, or the space to make the right choices so drop and replacements offer an ability to carry on operating fleets as we have done historically but still make a difference today there's an education piece which i'm really glad to see the department for transport and zemo have actually really stepped up the mark uh, to help people make the right decisions and the right pathway choices and I think really conferences like this are, 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 are helpful um, in, in letting people showcase um, good, good case studies that work. You know, how did, how did we transition a dust cart fleet or a, to, to the electric dream? It wasn't go one step to electric, it was, you know, sustainable fuels and then some electric and then some EV and then more EV and, and so these are all little steps, as Tanya quite rightly said. And then I think clarity and transparency. So I think also Zemo within the Glorious Scheme has really helped people understand the carbon intensity of their activities. Um, so it's removing the fear factor of change um, and that comes through education. Great, thank you very much. Um, Grace, I guess with a slightly different perspective, Yeah, I think I think from our perspective, the thing that we're focusing on at the moment is the infrastructure piece. That's what we hear a lot from uh, our conversations with industry and where we feel government can really play a role in supporting this transition and also understanding which of these future technologies, HGVs, where they play a role in the UK and how we want to deploy each of these technologies. So apologies that not everyone heard my presentation, but I will uh, refer back to our zero emission road freight trials, which we're funding this year, which will look into <clears throat> the technology and infrastructure requirements for different zero emission HGV technologies uh, to hopefully answer that question. Cool, thank you very much. Uh, Brian, I'll stop hogging the limelight now. Um, <laughs> questions in chat. Got nine lines. All right. Um, how, how long have we got? We've we've got. Uh, I'd say about five minutes before we'd need to start winding things up a little bit. Right. Okay. So time. But we had uh, various questions for uh, Cliff. Um, many of them centering around the refrigeration issue. So um, um, Martin Platt, for example, Tim Barlow, asking about the impact of refrigeration on range of the electric vans. Uh, and asking about whether the band are pre-chilled by being plugged in or whether the battery has to do uh, the bulk of the work. Um, so uh, Cliff, uh, refrigeration. Yeah, uh, thanks, Brian. Um, so yeah, we, we, we do pre-chill. Uh, we get a benefit from that. So um, it's, it's not such a big impact to, uh, to our current dot-com fleet operation. Obviously, it is weather-reliant anyway, um, but certainly for EVs, within our modelling, we've included refrigeration. Um, uh, obviously, I've mentioned about pre-chilling. There was a question, I think, about how that how is that powered. So we do use um, a sort of DC to DC converter uh, to power um, what is an electric fridge uh, rather than a hydraulic fridge. Um, 
certainly what we're seeing in in the whole refrigeration market if i if i sort of then transfer into the lgv uh, sort of world there are options of uh, you know using magnus's hvo fuel um we're starting to see engineless fridge technology for the for the heavy goods uh, refrigerated trailers and i know that that will that will move at pace again you're reliant on on electrical hookups on your loading bays to be able to uh to, to to give the power while you're loading and even in trailer parking bays so there's lots of um lots of technology starting to come up powered axles uh and battery packs on trailers providing that energy for refrigeration units so it's it's quite a, an evolving uh technology that uh, certainly interests me uh and it's it's one of a number of projects that i'm running at the moment to, uh, to see how we introduce that technology into tesco Perfect answer. Thanks, uh, Cliff. And I've uh, a chance to uh, plug Zemo activity. We're very much, um, as Bob mentioned in his, uh, Bob Moran uh, mentioned earlier, uh, transport refrigeration units, refrigeration is a key issue for, for DFT uh, and others. We, we're certainly looking to getting very, more heavily engaged. We've done, done quite a fair bit of work on TRU testing protocols over the last few years. Uh, we will certainly be looking to do a lot more. So uh, if you're interested in the truck refrigeration market, you're not already a member of Zeno, Zemo, then um, join today and, uh, and get involved with our commercial working group. Um, well, one more question, perhaps, James. We've got time. Yeah, yeah we can sneak. We can sneak a, a short one in. Should, yeah. should we open up the old um, bringing um, uh, Tanya again and open up the old pantograph uh, debate? Um, and I know David Seabon was also on the line, so apologies, David. I haven't. I don't think we have time to ask your biofuels question. Although hopefully the renewable fuel assurance scheme kind of addresses that issue, but. Um, David might have something to say as well on the topic of uh, pantograph. So the uh, the question was from Robert Ward for Tanya. Can, can some detail be put to that issue? Scania doing trials in Germany looking at vehicles using pantographs. Tanya. Yeah, I mean, it's not something I'm particularly close to. I mean, we've been involved in trials in Germany and in Sweden. Um, so there is some background and some science behind what's been happening out there. I think it's an interesting thing. I think it's something that we... That we should definitely um we should be looking at and um uh, yeah i think if you think about the corridors and moving things from a to b to c and being able to have that extra part in the middle and then interacting with it with a battery electric vehicle i think it's a, an interesting concept but yeah i mean i don't have direct insight on it i'm afraid but i did put into the chat that i'm looking forward um to hear about these trials that are coming out i know grace that you've you mentioned it on your slide deck, but do we know when, Grace? Would that be before or after summer? Do we know when that might come out? <laughs> if you're allowed to tell us. Oh, do you sure. mean do you mean announcing who we're funding this year? Yeah, the zero emission freight trials. I she can't I can't hear her. No, I think I think we've got a, a, a dodgy connection, I think. So maybe David, maybe you want to come in at this point, David, because obviously you're the master of this in this area. <laughs> well, we we know that uh, Innovate UK has put out a call for um, uh, feasibility studies for the zero emission road freight trials. Uh, that was one for strand one for electric road system and uh, strand two for hydrogen. The call is closed uh, a month or two ago, and we believe that uh, there that um, uh, Innovate UK will be announcing a number of projects in that area. Uh, broadly, uh, for Strand 1, we believe that uh, the aim is to do a feasibility study for um, uh, a, uh, uh, an electric road system trial, uh, electric road system demonstration trial in the UK uh, to take place between kind of 2022 and 25, something like that. Um, and uh, that there'll be an announcement about that feasibility study soon. So should all that work, uh, should all that go through correctly as planned by DFT, then we'll see a feasibility study taking place between now and the end of this coming financial year. A decision to go forward on, we think, a hydrogen study and a electric road study uh, in something like the following 22, 23 financial year. So uh, I think it's fair to say that DFT and um, uh, funders are on track to fund a major, major study of uh, electric roads. Um, they still have to get money 
from Treasury, but uh, that's what they're trying to do. So I think that's great. That's the right thing to do. That will mean that by around about 24 or 25, it should be possible to make an objective decision about how the UK should go forward to replace those diesel trucks, which are being phased out, as we've just heard in the uh, transport decarbonisation plan. So I think that's all pretty positive and welcome that. And I hope we'll hear an announcement from uh, Innovate and uh, DFT rather soon uh, about that, um, that work. Thank you, David, that was excellent. Um, yeah, Grace has just popped something into the chat actually. Uh, well, time has marched on guys. Um, we've got a minute to go. I have been told that technically we get cut off at 10 past. So I just thought I'd, I'd thank, take the opportunity right now in case that happens uh, to thank um, our panelists uh, for taking the time and participating in the discussion. Uh, for you guys as the audience, and apologies again for the technical hitch that kept you out for the first 20 minutes or so. Um, just proves that uh, virtual isn't quite perfect. Um, but yes, uh, thank you all for your time. Uh, and now uh, I'd like to direct you back to the main plenary session, which starts uh, about now, actually. So thank you very much, guys. Cheers. <laughs>